He was quite the gentleman, I think, Mr. Mm -hmm. Heaton. He was, he was a man to ride the river with, as it were. He, he looked like a big man. He was a tough man, mm -hmm. very tough. He won, I think it was a silver medal or a bronze medal at, at the Olympic Games in 1936, I think it was. He could lay down and shoot, and he could, he could bounce up in a handstand, straight up on. Stress and, and you know, you know, trying to save them people, knowing that there was nine alive when he started, and he could only save five, probably really affected. Pappa. Kan inte du berätta den där historien igen? Ja, när jag var 22 år så var jag ute och reste i Australien. Mm. Och eh, av olika anledningar så juldagen 1988 så hamnade jag hos eh, Frälsningsarmen på Tasmanien. I Queenstown, Tasmanien. Och på kvällen så blev jag nerkallad till eh, han som var officer eh, i tjänst där. Okay. Han ville prata med mig. Och eh, han berättade att i byn bredvid, som heter Strån, så hade de ett problem med en svensk man som var äldre och hade blivit dement. Och de ville att jag skulle åka dit och se om jag kunde förstå, för de förstod att han ville någonting, men de kunde inte förstå vad han sa. Han var äldre man, han pratade lite förvirrat, men den historia han berättade för mig var helt fantastisk. Han visade också att han hade en medalj som han visade för mig. Som han hade fått av, som jag förstod, den amerikanska armén. Och jag vet inte vad det var för medalj. Jag kunde inte förstå. Att hans historia skulle man dokumentera på något sätt. Eller skriva om honom. Eller göra ett reportage om honom. Jag har tänkt många gånger. Men det har aldrig blivit av att jag fått återvända till Australien. Så att... Nu hoppas jag att ni kanske kan göra det. Vem var egentligen den gamla mannen i husvagnen? Hur hade han hamnat i Australiens utkant? Och vad var det egentligen för medalj? Historien som min pappa berättade fastnade hos mig. Flera år senare berättade jag om mannen i husvagnen för min vän Elin. Tillsammans började vi mejla campingar i Strand. Och snart hade vi kontakt med flera invånare som visste vem vi letade efter. Mannen föddes i Örebro 1899 och hette Gustav Hedin. Många vi ville prata med använde inte internet. Så vi bestämde oss för att åka ner till Tasmanien och höra deras historier personligen. Tagning ett. We're in Australia. Strong är en idyllisk by på västkusten med ungefär 650 invånare. Och det var hit Gustav flyttade i 60 års åldern. En av de första personerna vi ville prata med var Carrie Hamer. Han hade varit ordförande för Strands skytteklubb där Gustav hade varit medlem. We're looking for Carrie. Carrie? Yeah. Carrie Hayward? Carrie Hayward. Oh, he's a... So if you keep walking along the road here... Yeah? yeah. He's right at the end of the road. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank, Thank you very you. much. No worries. Hi. Uh, Hi. Hi. Uh, we're looking for Carrie Hayward. Yeah, we're calling. Oh, is that you? Yeah. Yeah, hi. <laughs> uh, we just talked to your wife, so we said we'll find you here. Right. Uh, my name is Alan Johnson. Right. Hi. Victoria. So. Right. Okay. Uh, we're making a documentary. Right. About a Swedish man named Gus Hedin. Gus Hedin from Sweden. Yeah. Who yeah. lived there 30 years ago. Yeah. Well. Have you got time for us? Oh. Oh. Well, not really. But... No. Oh. We can come back. <laughs> Do you can come oh. back later if you like. Yep. Well, tell me what you want to know. Uh, we'd like to. Well. I hear your stories about him and some stories about him. Yeah. Well, he 
Come, I don't know what, what year it was, it probably 470. I reckon he came to Strawn, I don't know whether that's right or not. Um, and he, he shot with a Strawn Rifle Club. He, at, uh, I'm not sure the age, of, he was in his 90s, I think, when he died, was he? Yeah. yeah. Yep, well, probably up to 85, we'll say. He, he'd do a handstand off the mound. He could lay down and shoot, and he could, he could bounce up in a handstand, straight upright. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it was a bit of a comic with his shooting, because we, you, you could use paste on your bullets, which is supposed to help the barrel. Uh, but he used to coat his bullets with heaps and heaps of it, and when he fired a shot off, you couldn't see him for half, half an hour because of powder and the dust and smoke and everything was still about him. And uh, he built a boat while he was here, as a matter of fact, just down behind that white boat there. Yeah. Over against the shore, there's a couple of piles up there. He, he built a wharf for himself and oh, actually really? made a track through the bush there. And that's where mm -hmm. he used to keep this boat that he built. Oh. But it was not necessarily built out of Yon Pine. It was a very heavy boat and barely floated. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, he, was, he was quite a bit of a comical fella. And his he's, he's saying mainly was you, uh, you can beat an egg, but you can't beat a Swede. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so. Yeah, he lived, he lived down in Merida Street when, about when he first came to Strawn and he built a shack down there. Um, he later sold it to Tuck Ludby. He's out there. Okay. <laughs> okay. He's either in the sheds or down in the yard. I'll just have to hunt for him. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Gus, Hadim, they used to live down here. Yeah, I remember Gus. Uh, Gus, I couldn't remember what his other name was. Yeah, um, what's his other name? Uh, Hadim. Hadim. Yeah. 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 yeah, he's booked up twice. He actually booked up twice. It's in my backyard. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. All right. Would you have you got time to tell us about him? Well, I don't really know much about him, but but he come oh, from uh, when he come here. He come from the Yukon. Yukon, yeah. And he was, uh, oh, when he come here, because he thought this was as cold as, would be as cold as the Yukon, right? Oh, he did. And so when he built this building, he built it like they built them in the Yukon. Totally insulated. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's... He was a good rifle shot. Did you know he actually won? He won, I think it was a silver medal or a bronze medal at, at the Olympic Games in 1936, I think it was. Oh, really? In Germany, yeah. That was when Hitler had to turn oh. out with the, with the dark people. Yeah. Right? And I'm pretty sure that was the year he won his medal. Well, this is the little shack he built. Is this the shack? Yeah, this is the little shack he built. Oh, wow. Yeah. Ooh, the snakes around here? Yeah, this is just uh, an old shack. This is a fireplace wall in the So this is the fireplace. Yeah. And you look up in the room, and you can see how he, how he built it. Det var den här stugan som Gustav byggde när han bosatte sig i stan. Stugan på Tatsgård är också vårt första fysiska bevis på att Gustav faktiskt varit här. I'll tell you what, it's built that strong, 
you would not believe how strong it was built. See this mark here? See this mark here? Yeah. That's how far down under the ground. My cousin built the ground up around it, and that's where the ground was built up to. Okay. Up there. And when I lift it out of the ground, I put those things here under it. Yeah. Right? The whole building brought the foundations up out of the ground. It brought three courses of concrete up out of the ground. I had three yucks. Mm. I had nine ton push trying to lift it. And when it finally did come up, it brought the bloody foundations and all. That's how well it was built. Had it been me, I'd have built it with no foundations, so when it got in the flood, it would have floated. <laughs> you know what? Right? Yeah. Good old dust. Ett annat tips ledde oss till Don och Sandra Grinning som bott grannar med Gustav. Och när vi kom dit ringde Don till sin granne som också varit medlem i Strans skytteklubb. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Sweden. This is Brian. Brian Callum. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Hello. So, yeah, sit down there and like, have a talk to the girls. <laughs> Well, I can't tell them much because my dad knew more more about old Gus than I did because he used to deal with him a lot in the rifle club. Yeah, well, I'm just saying, you was in the yeah. club when Gus was shooting, though, weren't yeah. you? Yeah. I'd sort of finished shooting by the time Gus oh, yeah. got in there. Some of the Queenstown team were down and and they, they had a bit of an argument with old Gus and he just stood there and jumped up and touched his toes with his hands and, and then he said, when you can do that, he said, come back then and when, then we'll have an argument. <laughs> <laughs> he was he'd been a gymnast, yeah. didn't he? Yeah. Yeah. But he was certainly, uh, he was certainly a character. And, but he, uh, I knew, you knew, he told you, you knew about that business where he actually got that citation for rescuing those people out of that lake in Canada. No, I didn't know about that. Yeah. He got, a, he got a certificate where he'd actually, there was about five of them, they got out in the ice in a lake and it collapsed on them. They went into the lake mm. and Gus got them out. But he rescued about five of them. Vid 19 års ålder bestämde jag mig för att ta värvning i Svea Livgard upp i Stockholm. Efter sex års tjänstgöring fick jag ett brev från en bekant som uppmanade mig att resa till Kanada. Och ett år senare var jag på väg. Jag tycker om att ha det lugnt omkring mig. Gillar inte städer. Så jag flyttade runt på landet i Kanada. Tog ströjobb och sökte efter en fin plats att bosätta mig på. En dag fick jag ett tips som ledde mig till Charlie Lake. 600 km väster om Edmonton. Där röjde jag mark och byggde hus- Senare fick jag jakträtt på ett stort skogsområde. Nu kunde jag äntligen börja försörja mig som pälsjägare. Efter resan till Strand åkte jag vidare till Kanada tillsammans med min kompis Matilda. Jag hade fått kontakt med Larry Evans som i sitt stora intresse för stadens historia visste precis vem Gustav Hedin var. Whoa, 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 
Hello. Hey, Chris, how you doing? I'm on a mission. You're on a mission. I got, is, I got your email. Oh, you did? I got it this morning, yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. This is Victoria, hi, Victoria. and Matilda. They're from Sweden. Oh. Hi. They're doing a story on Gus Hyden. Gus? Yes. Wow. Can they have a look at the cabin there? Absolutely. Gustav flyttade från Kanada för 63 år sedan. Men trots det mötte vi personer som kom ihåg när han bodde här. My dad had a trap line at the way over Stardew Creek area, but he used to go to, to Gassadine's place and and he had a dog team and he'd stop and visit with Gus. Mm. Yeah, they had a great time and he always talked about Gassadine. Yeah. He had a cabin over there and maybe a trap line too, I don't know. Oh, he did, yeah, he had a trap line. Yeah. Yeah, so they'd the talk over their furs and the prices and where did we send the furs to? All that stuff, you know. I was only eight years old, ten years old, twelve yeah. years old, and Dad was trapping then, so. Okay. But I just remember the Gussadine, you always talked about Gus. <laughs> <laughs> so that's been good friends. I never met the guy. <laughs> Tell yes. me your name first. Then who My name. Is. Oh boy, it's a big long one. Bill Tompkins. <laughs> yes. That's what I'm so, how do you know about Gus? About Gus. How Gus. do I know about him? Yeah. I met him a few times, maybe only twice, at Powell's. I married a Powell. Yes. yes. I married uh, the youngest daughter, Audrey. You probably never uh, knew Audrey. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. Well, I, I, I knew of her and I knew her to see her, but that's all I knew. Bill. Yes. So it was always Mrs. Thompson. He was stuff. he was a neighbor of of the Powells. I don't think he I don't think he lived over a mile away. I don't think it was. I no, used to fly have, over his cabin. He would have been close, yeah. The cabin up on, on the other side of the lake there. On the east side of the lake. Yeah. That's where he had his cabin. See those soldiers that he rescued, they put their initials, carved their initials in the tree there. In the tree. On the tree. Oh. I know that. Because I can remember that. And that he was also said that he wrote their names on the back of a cupboard door or something in his. He cabin. probably did. Yeah, because he was he was quite the gentleman, I think, Mister mm. Heaton. He was he was a man to ride the river with, as it were. He, he looked like a big man. He was and, a tough man. Yeah. Very tough. Well, to very he, athletic. Do you remember the, the accident? Oh, I sure do. Oh yes, you better do. I think that's why he left here. He went a little bit, I won't say crazy, but it really, really affected him. Yeah. Because he could only take two in his boat. After attacken on Pearl Harbor 1941, började USA bygga Alaska Highway. 11 000 soldater kom till norra British Columbia och många var utplacerade i Fort St. John. Charlie Lake användes för att skeppa material upp norr. I, Gustav A. Hedin of the Charlie Lake St. John, in said county of Caribou, being sworn, said I'm a trapper living at the northwest end of Charlie Lake, about 16 miles from Fort St. John, B.C. On the morning of the 14th, I got up late as I was very busy the day before. Whilst having breakfast, I saw something on the lake, and getting my glasses made out a loaded pontoon ferry coming up the lake in about one and a half miles from my residence. I was watching it and saw it swerve toward the northeast. I went in and finished my breakfast then came out to see what progress it had made facing the strong steady north wind. This was about 10 minutes after my first view. No boat was visible. I scanned the lake where I had last seen the scope and noticed a bunch of dark objects resembling ducks at that distance. I again got my glasses and made out men beating the water and realized the tragedy that had happened. I ran to my boat and rowed as fast as possible to the scene and within 80 rods known for certain that a scow had sunk. And I could hear the men calling for help 
In a few minutes I arrived on the scene and found nine men afloat. The first I came to were two men hanging onto a barrel of gas, one on each side. One man was inside a life boy, and I told him to hang on as I thought it would be safe. But he had gone when I returned from the first trip. The icy water had evidently been too much for him. Having hauled the first two survivors ashore, I immediately returned for a second trip. I made for three men hanging onto a plank about a feet long and pulled two up to the boat. The water was too rough to load them in and they were so stiff their arms remained rigid. I wrapped a rope around the wrist on the third and telling him to hang on and made for sure. The third man hang on for about 50 yards and then let go. I couldn't help him further as I had to get the other ashore before they also sunk. And for so small a boat, the rough water was very dangerous in any case. I dumped him about 50 yards south of the first two on the west shore and made a third trip. I aimed for the center of the two remaining afloat to be extra sure of getting at least one more. They were over 100 yards apart. One sunk before I reached him 75 yards away. I however swerved over the side but could see nothing of him and made for the remaining man on the plank. He was about finished, his eyes glassy and fixed, and I pulled him to the boat and hooked him on and made for the shore. I worked him in for half an hour to fetch him and then rolled him into my boat and made for my cabin one and a half miles away. Took him in, warmed him up, gave him tea and did all I possibly could to help him and put him to bed. While rowing home along the shore I looked to see how the others were faring, but saw nothing. I also shouted all the way but could make no one hear. So I concluded they had made it into the bush, but later found they had fallen asleep. Heated by the sun after the shook of the immersion in the icy cold water, an hour and a half later, they arrived at the cabin where I was still working on the first arrival. They had stripped themselves of their icy water soaked clothing and were traveling light. I welcomed them with hot tea in a superheated cabin. An hour or two later, when we were all recovering from our experiences, I saw another scope coming up the lake on the east side. The debris of the wreckage had drifted to the west side and the crew had noticed nothing unusual until I signaled them in and told them of the accident when they took over. My boat is very small, with a low freeboard, and I did not dare to try to load them and rescue the alone in very choppy water. I should have been in the front. Can you do this, Larry? Yeah. Give me an hour's notice, I'll make sure the trail's fixed. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is the old cabin. <laughs> uh, it wasn't very big, uh, but this is actually a very typical um, trapper's cabin. Uh, it's actually even big for a trapper's cabin for remote areas. It's more like a home uh, for back in those days for. Uh, and this is why this was his, I think his main cabin. This would have been his primary residence, and he yeah. might have, you know, depending on how far his trap lines went, he might have had smaller cabins. He on had, his trap lines. he had four. Did he? Yeah, four other cabins that went almost all the way around the lake. Okay, so if but, he had uh, other cabins, they would be about a quarter of the size of this to yeah. stay overnight. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, just if they got caught out because yeah. the winter time was was when they did the most. Yeah, and of the he trapping. would have done everything by either snowshoe or dog sled yeah. at that time. He wouldn't have had yeah. snowmobiles or anything. Like that. Yeah. I believe there's a window that was over there. On the front, down. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, uh, we, we intend on slowly taking up all this uh, debris from the old cabin and, uh, and then, you know, trying to find whatever we can underneath the floorboards of what's in here. There may not be anything, but there, you never know what we might find. No. And, and then we, uh, sometime my wife and I tend to rebuild the cabin. 
You do? Yeah, yeah. We've always had that in, in our plans to rebuild yeah. the cabin. Yeah. It would be amazing to see it standing again because it looks... Wow, you know what? You just have amazing. to give us your contact information and when we get it done, we'll send you pictures. Yes, please. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, he would have been able to see all the way around the lake. Yeah. So yeah. he had a window on that side, a window on that side, a window on that side. So we could actually three, see three yeah. sides of the lake. Det var ett hårt och ensamt liv i skogen. 1948 hade jag fått nog av trapper livet och hälsan sviktade. Jag sålde min trapline och åkte med ett lastfartyg som skulle till Sverige. Planen var att slå mig ner för gott. Efter ett halvår till sjöss satte jag min fot i Sverige för första gången på över 20 år. Jag besökte min mor och tog sedan en anställning på en kringresande cirkus. Men svenskarna hade blivit ett nervöst folk, förtryckta av stränga lagar och höga skatter. Dessutom gjorde regeringen allt för att försvåra emigrationen. Efter ett år gav jag upp livet i Sverige och bestämde mig för att åka mot Australien som jag hade passerat på vägen från Kanada. Jag anlände till Darwin 1951. Där livnärde jag mig på att jaga krokodiler och hajar. Men efter fem år fick jag tropiska sår på benet och blev tvungen att åka söderut till svalare klimat. Jag var då 57 år och började närma mig pensionen. I knew Gus probably not quite as long as Kevin knew him, but sometimes I'd visit him and take him, um, you know, if I'd be cooking, I'd take him something to, yeah, share some cooking with him. But he was very independent, but he always said to me, I don't eat unless I'm hungry. And he won a silver medal, I think. At, gold medal? It was a gold medal for at gymnastics the at, at the Olympic Games. Games. And I don't know what year that was. Were the, were the Olympic Games in Sweden? I don't know, Kalina, but it was in. It was a long, long time ago. No one knew that because Gus wasn't a, a person that shared many secrets. But when you talk to him, he'd, he'd open up and he'd tell you a, a, a story. It was funny. He used to always entertain the kids on the bus when he go to Queenstown and tell them stories about his ill health and what he had wrong with him. And there was a lady at the post office and she was a, a bossy sort of a woman and Gus uh, would go in there and he'd, he'd get a bit muddled up and uh, uh, posting letters or whatever and she'd really, really start bossing him around. So he'd start saluting her. <laughs> 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 he shifted from his little shack in Meredith Street out to Mrs. Wesselman's at Loana and he lived on a little dairy farm there. You're doing a, a oh, film on yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And who knows him? Uh, my dad, he met him. Once. Oh yeah. Yeah, oh, he really? met him when he was backpacking, 88. Yeah, it will do too, yeah. Yeah. That'd be in the... That'd be in People's Park, would it? When he had a he had an old caravan in there. Yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. 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 He, he, when he left here, he, when when I when I come here to I, I had a pig store in Queenstown, a pig see, in Queenstown. I lived in Queenstown. Yeah. And I used to come down here and buy a few calves off Mrs. Wesselman, see, and, and take them back home there and fatten them, sell them. And then one day she said, "I'll show you this farm." I said, "Oh yeah, right over then." So, yeah. all that. Ten years time, I come down to buy some calves, and she said to me, "You can buy the farm now." I said, "Oh yeah, right, I did." I said, "I went and got the bank manager and bought him down and showed him the house and the the milking shed and the other little sheds and a few old milking cows here." And uh, she told us how much she wanted, so we just wrote the check out yeah. for it. Yeah. Yeah, and old Gus sort of I sort of bought him with the fur. He come, yeah. <laughs> he was a funny little thing, wasn't he? Yeah. Because we yeah. come down here and we, they said, Oh, there's an old man that lives in the shed. 
And we thought, yeah. oh, yeah. And we <laughs> sneak down because there was a little window and we try and sneak in there, look, have a look. But then once he got used to us all being here... He was we, right then. Yeah, yeah, he was good as gold. But he always wore a jacket and he was just yeah. this little, tiny little man. And yeah. like in the end, he got used to us, so we go in and he'd talk. We didn't have a clue what he's bloody saying. But like about letters from home and stuff, and I really I should have hunted him out. But he used to give me all the stamps of his letters. So at home, I've in one of me in the boxes in the shed, I've got all these stamps that he gave us. Yeah. And it was amazing. It was this funny thing, he had this, all this little grey hair, and yeah, he was sweet. Yeah. But he bloody, uh, he used to work for old Mrs. Wesley here. He used to cut a bit of firewood for the house here and, and milk the cows and. And do a bit of few jobs around about the place, and then when we oh, bought the farm, we we was milking the cows and selling the milk, and then we were selling the chook eggs and the duck eggs and everything like that. And then one morning we got up, we couldn't wasn't getting no eggs. I said that's funny. I said the chooks haven't got off the lay, but old Gus was getting the eggs at first light of the morning. Yeah. So we so we put a lock on the chook house door. By Jesus, didn't he go crook? The next day, because he couldn't get no eggs, you see, <laughs> he's four and cursed. Well, we said, look, Gus, I said, well, we've got to sell the eggs to get a living. I said, so we, we'll just give you some. So we did that. Because you never seen him sort of during the day. He'd be, you wouldn't see nah. him. And then, and the little hump, he was always dark and it was really yeah. warm and it was just like... But, oh, mm. Jesus, when you open that door yeah, on oh. that little camp, the kerosene fumes. Yeah. You used to cut <laughs> in kerosene either. And the kerosene fumes used to come out and hit me in the face. Oh, nearly, nearly, you nearly roll over with the, the bloody poison or something. Now, how he never died in there, it's got me beat. Yeah, because he never ever had the door open, no. ever. No. Or only a little bit, and we'd like have a look and then we'd run away. Yeah. But then once he got used to everyone being around, he'd invite us in. He used to, like, he used to like me. Yeah. He liked me. He used yeah. to say, John. You are spending too much money on the farm. I said, well, Gus, I said, I've got to paint the sheds, I've got to build fences, I've got to build gates. I said, we've just got to spend some money to, to get it right. But he used to go crook at me. John, he used to call me. <laughs> Det är ganska otroligt hur vi började vår research utan att ens veta Gustavs namn till att resa över två kontinenter och möta alla dessa personer som öppnat sina hem och delat sina historier med oss. Under sina sista år led Gustav av demens. Han tappade engelskan och började prata svenska igen. Några månader efter att min pappa träffat honom flyttade Gustav in på ett boende där han senare gick bort. En dag i september 1989. Han var då 90 år gammal. We had a little funeral at the Anglican Church here in Straw, and I, there'd probably be about 60 people, I'd reckon, men that he'd made friends with, and just people who knew Gus, yes, or associated with him in some way. But yes, that's all I can remember really, just that it was a, as it would be, a simple little funeral, but yeah, and yes, that, you know, and, and then when you bury people like that, you sort of wonder how they might be remembered down the years. Mm. Someone who'd had such an interesting life. Yes. You know, people, because you said there was a headstone, didn't you? Yeah. Yes. But, Good stuff, wasn't it? Yes. yes. But people would look at that and not know that he'd won, you know, medals from the Royal Humane Society in Canada or that he'd won a medal in the Olympic Games as a gymnast. And Yeah, it's a pity you couldn't put all those things there. Very interesting history. Sen när vi ska åka därifrån, då var han. Uh... Han, ganska snar, han sa liksom att nu är jag trött, nu behöver jag vila, nu är det dags för att åka. 
Och när jag åkte därifrån så ställde han sig i vakt. Och, och, när jag, och vinkade när jag åkte iväg med bilen. Och den där minnesbilden har jag med mig kvar. Hur, jag, hur han står där vid sin husvagn i givakt. Gustav fick ta emot en medalj från Royal Humane Society of Canada och hedrades av både amerikansk och kanadensisk militär. 2008 restes ett monument till minne av de soldater som drunknade och de fem som överlevde, tack vare Gustav. well known in town, people cared about him and he was always said he was a Swede who came to Australia and would quite often tell stories of his trapping and his adventures all over the place.